Chapter 65 The Seventh Essence The ground battle was now under the control of Xander and the wolves. Lydia and the others turned their full attention to the swooping evil attack, aiming a barrage of spells into the air. The flying horrors were both fast and agile, dodging the spells and swooping in to strike in coordinated waves. Some of the companions shot seal spells over the heads of their friends, saving them from the snapping jaws. Lydia saw Dean draw his broom and beat his bat from his pack. No, Dean, she shouted. Leave this to me. A thought, an idea, had occurred to her. She was at the point closest to the altar world, the source of their high magic. The strength of her spells attested to that. But the altar world was a world alike in some ways to their own. Lydia had tapped into the old magic of her own world when it was close. It's about the old magic, the power of nature, of the altar world. She put the wandwork and incantations of the high magic to the back of her mind and focused on her intent and her expectations. Look out! Shona shrieked. Lydia looked to where she was pointing. An army of armoured knights on horseback was spilling onto the battlefield, coming through a wide portal which shimmered in the air a few hundred metres away. They formed a line facing the castle, the later arrivals forming ranks behind the first. Their general moved his horse out from the front rank. Now it was time for Lydia to act. The Inferi and their wolves had scattered, burned, torn and crushed by Xander and her own wolves. The swooping evil were attacking the wolves as they lined up to face the cavalry who opposed them. These air attacks would harry her wolves, and the horsemen would cut them down. She had to stop this. Lydia imagined the ultimate expression of the magic of nature, and channelled it into her being, drawing on the natural power of the altar world. She stretched herself, and spread her wings wide, beating the air into tornadoes with the power of her muscles and magic. She rose into the panicking cloud of tiny, fluttering black creatures, inhaling a deep breath. Fire sprang into being in her breast. She opened her long jaws and, with a sweep of her scaly neck, sprayed dragon fire through the swirl of swooping evil. What remained of them dropped, smoking to the ground, as the red dragon that was Lydia wheeled in the sky over the castle. She looked down. Xander was rallying the wolves, but holding them back between the companions and the horse warriors. The general of the horsemen was signalling a charge. Lydia wheeled around again and stooped towards the cavalry, the ball of fire raging in her breast. The dragonfire hit the charging army with the fury and force of a bomb, blasting riders and horses across the battlefield, flesh charred and armour glowing orange with the heat. The cavalrymen on the further edge of the host struggled with their mounts. Many turned and fled through the shimmering portal. Only their leader remained untouched by the dragonfire. Lydia banked and glided towards the castle, transfiguring back into herself as she fell the last metre to the grass, elated by the flow of power she had experienced. Xander's flames died down as he sprang up the hill to Lydia. He stood before her in his glory, his fur shining as though it still held the light of his fire. Lydia was sobbing and laughing, but stood up. Come here, you daft cat, she scolded. I thought we'd bloody lost you. Toff, he said. No such luck. I decided I'd invite the lads to join us. Bring a few friends, too. I'm glad they saw sense. Those scruffy wee beggars looked like they were squaring up to charge you. Our wolves made short work of them. And thank you for saving us from the horsemen. It might have gone badly otherwise. I like the dragon. Very classy. Ah, behind you, lass. Lydia turned to look. The Grey Watcher had returned, standing between her and the ruined castle. The sounds of battle had faded to nothing. Lydia looked out over the battlefield. The horses and their riders, what remained of them, were still and silent. All she could hear was the cawing of crows searching for fresh corpses. We have reached an impasse, he said. You burn my troops. I throw more at you. You call on the forest for aid. I will burn the forest from here to the cities in the east and the 
south, the northern mountains, the western sea. Let's call it a draw, Lydia said. There is no draw, he said. We settle through single combat. You have seven minutes. Choose a champion. In another swirl of mist, he was gone. Everyone to me, Lydia called. Tell the others. They gathered together by the steps, which led into the ruined castle. The wolves stood guard around them. Xander turned back into a cat and leapt onto Lydia's knee as she sat down on the top step to address her team. Ambrose stepped forward from the darkened doorway and sat beside her. Oddie appeared and sat on her other side. Oddie grinned. Hi, everyone. Greetings each and all, Ambrose added. I confess I am impressed and delighted at how well you have done. Especially your dragon, Lydia. Red. Very Welsh. I imagine you are a little fatigued after that exercise. Let us step inside the castle for a moment. He rose and ushered them inside. They passed through the archway into a hall with benches and tables. Bowls of fruit and jugs of drink stood on the bare wood. In the tapestries on the walls and the painted wooden ceiling thrived medieval hunting scenes and depictions of valour. Ambrose lifted a jug and a goblet and poured Lydia a drink of water. From the same jug he poured himself a goblet of wine. The others seated themselves at the tables and helped themselves to drinks. Dean found bread and cheese hidden among the fruit. The situation is this, Ambrose began. The watcher has issued a challenge of his own, for our champion do battle with his. What? said Lydia. He's not fighting. No, Ambrose replied. It seems neither he nor I can be the champion. They, the altar world, possess a warrior groomed and trained for such an occasion. The altar worlders call him Eldritch. I suspect that, like Watcher, it is a job title rather than a personal name. But that is inconsequential. He was the leader of the cavalry you dispatched. As you can see, he is a tough cookie. We must choose the challenger, not only to fight, but to work an important piece of magic, which will seal the gateway from the altar world. Okay, how do I... Lydia began. Have you identified the seventh essence yet? Ambrose asked. Love, Love said Lydia, Oddie and Shona together. Ambrose smiled. Indeed so. Love will be the basis of the spell to close the gateway. Do you also know what the ultimate expression of the seventh essence is? Lydia was reluctant to give what she believed to be the answer. Oddie answered for her. Sacrifice. Yes, sacrifice, Ambrose confirmed. With much of the greatest magic, sacrifice is required. It's all right, Lydia said. I thought this would be the case. I'm ready. If you could rest your jingling spurs for a moment, my dear, Ambrose retorted, there is more to be considered. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you have done well with your quest. Oddy brought me the sixth token. We have all the tokens. All of them. With the tokens, we can forge a magic of our own against Eldritch. Fredlington, my dear boy, do you have your comb? The one I so graciously gifted you at Christmas? Freddy shrugged. Sorry, I've no idea where it is, Ambrose. I mean, I just don't use combs much. I've got like this natural beauty thing going on. Please indulge me by looking in the inside pocket of your jacket. Ambrose suggested. Oh, yeah, Freddy said, holding up the comb. Ambrose swept the bowls and jugs off the nearest table with his arm. They disappeared before they reached the floor. If you would place your comb upon the table, Ambrose instructed Freddy. He did so. Ambrose produced the tokens, having the objects appear in his hand like a stage magician. He laid them in the line, touching each other. As he laid the last... The pointed seed Oddie had caught, the tokens and the comb glowed with a silvery light. The brightness died away. In place of the tokens and the comb lay a sword. Blinking away the afterimage of the glow, Lydia could see the blade had inlays of golden runes. They were in an ancient, unpronounceable language, 
but she knew they meant out of the essence of all. This is the blade of Parhemu, Ambrose told them. The name means from everything. It has not been used in this context before. Context? Corbin asked. I mean, it has never been employed to fight the champion of the altar world, the warlock explained. I have mentioned before that powerful magic may be wrought with the assistance of a willing sacrifice. By providing the tokens to make the sword, you have opened up the possibility that our hero might build a barricade across the gateway from the altar world. In effect, we could stop them coming through for a long time. And the great advantage for us is that Eldritch would provide the sacrifice. It is inherent in his appointment as their champion that he has willingly agreed to be a sacrifice if beaten. But, but our hero has to beat him, right? asked Dean. Exactly right, dear boy, Ambrose confirmed. And this sword is exceptionally good for doing precisely that. Then I might be the best choice to face this champion, Dean concluded, standing up. Stay your metatarsals for a moment, Ambrose advised. There is more to being a hero than merely possessing big muscles. There are the matters of love, and the willingness to sacrifice for that love. I do not believe you are ready in that respect. And there is also more than a hint of destiny involved. It's me, that you're interrupted. It's always been me. I've needed to be the hero all along. But it's okay. I've had time to get used to the fact. Ambrose frowned and tucked his beard. Are you truly willing, Lydia? Your acceptance is not the same thing. I believe you love. But a willingness to sacrifice yourself? You are worthy and powerful enough. However, I think you have unresolved business to attend to first. The matter of tracing your father, for instance. I'll go, said Oddie. He looked as surprised by his words as anyone else. Ambrose's smile was kind as he looked at the young man. How long do we have left? asked Lydia, a note of panic in her voice. We have as much time as we need, Ambrose assured her. The watcher gave us seven minutes, she insisted. We'd used a minute or two before we came into the castle. If we take too long, we might forfeit. Ambrose smiled an indulgent smile. If you would all look through the window opposite, please tell me what you see. A crow, said Christie. A raven, Lydia corrected. Black beak. And what is it doing? Ambrose prompted. Hovering, said Jimmy. What's your point, Ambrose? More specifically, look at how it is hovering, he prompted again. It's not moving, Dev noted. You've frozen time, Oddie asked in astonishment. I have slowed it down to give us a little more space to relax and discuss our options, Ambrose explained. Though relativistically, one could say I have speeded our time up. An added advantage is that it allows me to be here with you, which, strictly speaking, is against the rules. Now where were we? Deciding the hero should be the one to face Eldritch. Should be going, shouldn't I? Lydia said. I can follow your reasoning, Lydia, Ambrose agreed. And I thank Dean and Oddie for their generous offers. The thing is, my dear Lydia, you were never the hero. You were the leader of the quest, undoubtedly, and the deliverer of the true hero. Who is it? asked Sophie. Ambrose smiled in the manner that annoyed Lydia the most. I think there is a high probability it is the young person who took the sword while we were discussing ravens, and is currently walking out to face their champion. They ran to the archway, but stopped, unable to pass through. The Grey Watcher was standing facing the ruin, his cloak billowing around him. Beside him stood a tall warrior, clad in black armour. The glossy armour had many spikes and edges, designed to strike fear into his opponents. His visor was down, his face unseen. Walking towards the two dark presences was the lone figure of Fredlington Ferdinand Fortescue. He walked with his usual spring, but he held the sword awkwardly, as if uncomfortable with it. The she-wolf he had travelled with was by his side. 
She stopped. Freddy patted her and carried on a few more paces. They answer the challenge, the watcher said. The chosen child comes forth to do battle. We can't let Freddy... Lydia began. Shh, Ambrose hissed. These events cannot be reversed once they have been set into motion. Do Freddy the courtesy of appreciating his gesture. Most grown men would quail where he has not. What can he do? Shona whimpered. Wield the greatest sword any hero has ever possessed, Ambrose murmured. And he has a quality the altar worlders admire. Innocence. Let battle commence, the watcher roared. Eldritch, the champion, drew his sword. It was as black as his armour and as long as Freddy was tall. Freddy turned and waved at his friends. Then he bowed to the warrior. Then Freddy acted in a way not even Ambrose had foreseen. He held out his sword, hilt first to the watcher. A breathless silence reigned. Freddy said something his friends could not hear. The Grey Watcher and Eldritch looked at each other, then back at the young man standing so calmly before them. The Watcher reached out to take the sword. As he did so, Eldritch lifted his own blade to strike Freddy. There was a blinding flash and a thump of sound which shook the ground beneath them. The Grey Watcher, his champion, and all the creatures he had gathered disappeared. The barren field was empty, apart from a few startled crows. Freddy was nowhere to be seen.